Okay. Uh, is this, hey, is this thing on? Thanks. Yep. 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 Okay, it would, yeah, it's been on. Um, yeah, Leslie did half that last time. No, just kidding. Um, okay. So yeah, thanks for everyone for sticking around. Um, so so Lori and I, um, this is a, a talk that um, we initially um, thought of when we were together at um, Prague at the LinuxCon um, there. Um, about how a lot of the, the things that we've seen in, in our careers is really about collaboration and, and open source um, is obviously all about that, but we think it also provides a lot of business value. So we've got some examples from our, our business lives. Okay, so we'll introduce ourselves. Lori? Uh, hi, so yeah, I'm Lori Apple. I'm a cartoon character and a senior, senior pro, uh, program manager at Workday, which is HR financial management software company uh, based in California, but with offices worldwide. I'm in the Dublin, Ireland office. My colleague Ali is in the back row. Hello. Thanks for joining. Um, and I'm not really doing open source work these days anymore, uh, but my, the teams that I work on are using Kubernetes, Helm, and a variety of other open source uh, software pro programs. So. Um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, Eric Rydell. I was most recently um, spent nine years at, uh, at Dell EMC building large scale uh, storage clouds. Um, I've been involved in open source probably 20 years, um, 25 years as an engineer, 15 years um, as an engineering leader and, and director. So I've, I've built teams um, building open source. I've um, done open source um, uh, projects across the industry. Um, before open source, we used to call them standards projects uh, in the hardware space. Um, but it's very similar in, in collaboration. So a lot of experience with, um, with teams and, and collaboration. So we're going to try to share some of those with you today. So on our menu for today is uh, communicating in technology and, of course, in open source, which provides unique opportunities to communicate in different ways than you might in your day-to-day -day work. Um, communication magic. Eric will go into what that's all about. Empathy as, skill, as a skill. That's me. Shared goals. I think that's both of us. And an inclusion and collaboration across cultures, which we might have to speed through as we wind down, but uh, hopefully we will get to the exercise included there, and then Q&A at the end. Okay, so um, communication is an art form, and to practice an art form successfully usually requires a bit of discipline. And so um, this uh, slide is inspired by the work of Eric Fromm, uh, whose art of love was quite influential in psychoanalysis circles and psychology. Uh, that happens to be a hobby and interest of mine, psychology, brains, neuroscience. Um, so I saw, it was, this was at the end of the book, and I thought, well, golly, that's pretty applicable to how we talk to each other in software development. And when we're d disciplined, things tend to go pretty well. And, you know, I'm not talking about rigid rules, but uh, an expression of one's will, something that we develop organically over time, a disciplined approach to communication, communicating effectively, communicating clearly, uh, and communicating in a friendly, warm, inviting, collaborative way. Uh, concentration helps us to develop this discipline by becoming better and better over time through different exercises, exposing ourselves to different experiences, uh, doing mentoring or asking for mentoring and how to be a better communicator. And it really is about introspection, listening to others, gathering feedback on how we communicate so that we can continue to do so more and more effectively. And then patience, because this is a discipline or an art form that's going to take a lot of time. We all build habits over time and some of those are bad habits and it takes a while to break them. It also takes time to shift our bad habits into better habits. So uh, these three elements, which Eric Fromm had identified as essential to the art of loving people successfully, like in a, in a you know, very organic, natural, not rigid, not forceful, not controlling way, and also like being able to really connect with other people that we're trying to love, you know, really, for me, is, um, seemed perfect for, this, for our world. Um, a lot of times we think we are doing discipline, concentration, and patience. We go to work, we show up on time, we go to the meetings, uh, we work on our teams. But just doing those things on their own doesn't necessarily mean that we're living in the spirit of discipline, concentration, and patience if we're kind of on autopilot or we're not really contributing uh, proactively to those activities of you know, meetings, like do we 
Do we enable or empower others during those meetings? When we're working on our teams, are we actually talking to our team members? Are we just sort of uh, hoping that they understand this and letting it go? Um, hierarchies, which are pretty common in old school companies, don't make us collaborative either, even though they kind of assert that they are creating structure for all of us to collaborate, but it's really quite quite aut automatic in many cases. Um, and, the, and if there are toxic hierarchies, then people are going to rebel, which is obviously not discipline at all. Okay, so if um, we, we, what we listed out here is, is some common problems in, in tech projects, right? Um, we've got missed deadlines. Um, probably no one in this room, you're all well organized and never miss your deadlines, but, but it happens out in the, in the tech world. Right, there's, there's complaints about low productivity, maybe somehow tied to the time, but if we only had more time um, or more people, as comes lower down, um, maybe there's poor quality, right? And then, and then people, um, people issues. Often there's, there's high turnover um, and um, everyone complains about you know, the difficulty of, of recruiting, finding you know, quote unquote um, good people, right? And, and I think many of us, or certainly many of the industry um, that, that I um, regularly interact with, just feel like it's, it's always like this, right? That this is just the way that, that technology is, um, that um, it's always, things are always going to be late, things are always going to have to make compromises, um, et cetera. It's just the cost of, of doing um, tech business, right? And so the question is, does, does, it, have to, um, does it have to be that way? Of course, everything on the previous slide is true. Projects do get slow, inefficient, they're un, uh, unpopular to work with, they're not pleasant to work with on. Um, but if we just give in to the lowest common, denator, dom, common denominator, we're never going to get better, we're never going to really maximize our potential, and collaboration can be the way out of that sad state of affairs. So let's talk about talking. In open source, these are some of the key ways that we talk to each other. GitHub issues, the pull requests and code itself, Slack, meetings, meetups, Zoom calls, Google Docs, social media, one-on-ones, conferences. Um, think about which channels are most challenging to you. And also think about which channels you use most frequently and which ones seem to pay off or reap the most benefits for you. you know, maybe. In technology, the assumption is a lot of us are not uh, extroverts, so we don't really want to go out in front of a lot of people, or we're not getting our energy out of these big, crowdy uh, social interactions that might, re might require a lot of uh, conversation. So maybe we do all of our communication online, but how do we do that communicating? Is it clear, effective, structured? Do we think about how the reader is going to be able to intercept the information, really understand our point of view? and also not be hurt or offended by it because it's rude or uh, insensitive in some way. Um, how, if you are struggle with communicating or you're just kind of new to the scene and entering a project for the first time or a community and you really want to do well, collaborating and communicating is a priority for you, um, you can learn a lot from the land of therapy and psychology. So uh, this slide lists 10 principles for what's called intentional relationship design, which is a popular concept in therapy relationships. So when a client goes to see a therapist for the first time, the therapist can't just be their friend. It can't just, you know, it can't be like going to meet your friends for coffee and telling them about your day. There has to be a boundary set uh, to make the relationship effective. And, you know, that boundary can be easily uh, smashed if the therapist isn't de deliberate and, and vigilant about maintaining it. And so um, they also don't want to necessarily lead the client on to the conclusions. They have to be able to allow the client to arrive at conclusions themselves. And so these 10 principles were developed to help therapists manage that relationship successfully. So I'm not going to read them all out because they're right here for you, but um, being self-aware, learning, which you know, we call a growth mindset in the tech world, um, focusing on activities instead of like ideas or plans, but like actually doing things. Um, so having re results orientation, uh, cultural competencies so that one can communicate and collaborate with as many people as possible, and mindful empathy. 
um, which you know will help retain if you're running a project if you're empathetic to the contributors and users you'll retain them over time because you, they can you're engaging with them so why would one want to be intentional well I think I've hinted at it already in the previous slide but in open source software, reasons would be to reduce or eliminate conflicts or drama, which are negative and toxic forms of communication and collaboration. You can all collaborate on a big Twitter mess, you know, like something goes wrong. We, and the community can all just uh, point on Twitter at the outrage that ensues. Um, not a great use of time, but happens quite often. Uh, that's waste and delays of energy, um, goodwill, contributors, time effort. Uh, if you're intentional, you can avoid those by setting your boundaries early and often in the expectations for how everybody uh, can work together. Uh, confusion. Again, setting boundaries can clear that up. Here's what we all expect from each other. Now let us go forth and collaborate. Misalignment. Common in projects. Um, again, being intentional helps people to align so, and check in frequently to make sure they remain aligned instead of just kind of going off on tangents. Uh, it protects collaboration, builds trust, which is essential to any collaboration being successful, reduces cognitive load by replacing all that drama and awfulness with uh, focus and sharing of cel and celebrating of work done, and it drives experimentation because instead of arguing and fighting, you're thinking about how to collaborate and brainstorm together and you actually have the time to do it. When we're not being intentional, we do all those terrible Twitter outragey conflict things. Uh, we make assumptions and jump to conclusions based on emotions, so that prevents collaboration because we're coming at a situation with a, uh, from a place of fear or anger. We don't ask for what we need because we don't think we can get it. We just give in. It's just the opposite of uh, being aggressive, it's being passive. Uh, we become frustrated and ruminate, again, being passive. This means we lose opportunities. Uh, because we don't ask for what we want or figure out how we can um, get it. Uh, and then we rely on mind reading powder, powers that we don't have. So, uh, you know, we don't open up a conversation. We just assume that we know what the other person is thinking and give up. Uh, so we don't want to try these exercises here because there's not really time. But if you actually want to practice uh, some communication ex uh, skills, uh, here are a couple examples of ways you can do that. So, and you can actually apply these in your open source collaboration efforts. So a lot of times people will fire off an email or a comment on GitHub and maybe they regret it because it's like very hasty and blunt and even maybe rude or will just shut someone down. So to avoid that, create scripts or templates in advance to help uh, set up an empathetic response. So here's an example that we give you. Thank you for trying to understand my point. However, I think where we're still misaligned is blank. You know, what do you think? And then that's inviting somebody to communicate with you, and it's a lot better than like, no, you're wrong, goodbye. Um, another example would be, thank you for en your enthusiasm. I've noted your concerns and believe we might handle this concern or situation by, and then you make your proposal. And again, that's a lot better than saying like, that's a stupid idea, or we don't have time, it's not important, you know, getting rude and hasty. Um, and that's some magic uh, that you can add to your project and your interactions. And getting further into magic now is Eric. Yep, I, I got it. Oh, right, I yes. It. I just want to give you microphones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Um, for, to communicate better, right? Um, yeah, so, so, there's a, so the, those, the, the types of things that, that, um, that Lori talked about there are sort of guideposts in, in communications, right? And so, so I want to um, kind of change a slightly different story from, um, from my uh, experience on my most recent project. So, so it was an engineering project, a uh, large corporation. You know, like I said, we're building big cloud storage systems at the height. This was a 250-person development team spread around the world, um, you know, only maybe a, a dozen people in any geography um, altogether. So there was, there was a lot going on, right? a, lot of, a lot of communication. And, um, and one of the, the explicit decisions um, that we made in the leadership team at the beginning is that, that we were going to over-communicate um, in, um, in this project. So there was a, a lot of, of communication. And, and what we, um, at least what we took away from that, um, was that there was a lot of benefits, right? A lot of secondary benefits that maybe we hadn't quite intended, right? So um, we, 
Um, so what we did, um, the way we initially implemented this um, starting maybe five, five years ago, um, is we, we did these massive mailing lists. So, so there was, um, you know, at the beginning maybe there was only 30 of us, but even as we grew to 250 people, when a new person joined the group, they were added to an alias that was the, the uh, list of all the engineers on the team. And um, there was also an alias for um, escalations, if there was a problem with a customer. That was a link to the um, list of all the engineers on the team. And there was an alias for new design ideas, if, if someone wanted to propose some new um, aspect of the system. And it was a link to the same um, distribution list of all the engineers. So you can imagine, you know, people had all kinds of, of filters um, for their email. Um, a new employee was warned um, that, you know, within two days of joining the group, they'd be added to these email lists, and they'd be getting, you know, up to maybe 100 messages a day. Um, but what, what it embodied, more than just sending out lots of emails, um, was that the information was available for people. Um, and that was used in actually a lot of ways. Um, for example, like the, the archival history meant that um, folks that were coming to a problem um, fresh that maybe they hadn't paid attention to, um, they actually, so most, the way this happened most often was an escalation. So some customer would be angry about something and um, chances are that they'd actually been angry for some amount of time and there'd already been some engineers working on it before it hit you know, your particular component. My team was responsible for the hardware, for example. There'd usually be a bunch of debugging and diagnosis and other things would go wrong before someone would decide that it was the hardware's fault, right? But, um, but we had, um, in, in our inboxes, whenever something like that would occur, we would have a long archive that we could go back to, even if it first happened a month ago with this particular customer, as long as we had the right keywords, the information was right there, right? And um, in the same thing with um, design discussions, right? So like I said, we had you know, an alias, the design discussions that went to everybody, and people got used to kind of ignoring, hey, this is really not my part of the system, et cetera, but, but you had that archive, right? Um, in addition, um, there were often folks that um, were in remote geographies, or maybe they were you know, new to the team and were acting a little bit more in a support role. The QE team was also included in this, um, in, in the as part of the engineering team. And, and so there was a lot of people that had small, that were able to pick up small bits of information because we were spreading it very widely. Whereas if we had just centralized the information or tried to work out different streams of who needs what information, which all of us had experienced in previous projects, we would always miss um, somebody, right? So that was a great way to do um, shared state. And, and sort of luckily for our email inboxes, um, about two years into the project, we started using um, Slack. So we were also able to, to introduce with Slack and the combination of the emails a way to have more real-time um, responses so people didn't have to constantly monitor their email. Right? But the important point um, that, that I wanted to, you know, that I would take away um, from this is that we, we massively increased the amount of information that flowed through the organization and then we went back and, and occasionally thought about um, you know, how, to, um, how to optimize those flows but the, the baseline was that we sent probably an order of magnitude 10x as much information um, into the organization as any of us had experienced on past projects. And it was, it was better, rather, the, the, the upsides far outweighed the, the, the downsides of you know, the, the scary new person who's like, oh my gosh, I'll never be able to uh, recover again from all the emails. So, so there's an example. Okay, yeah. next part. And so thinking about that person, uh and recovering from the emails you know, shows empathy. So uh, let's talk a little bit about empathy and how it's a skill. And this isn't an idea that we came up with. It's kind of floating around the internet. Andrea Goulet, who's the CEO of Corgi Bytes in, I think, Virginia. Um, she's on Twitter. I think she's writing a book about um, legacy code and empathy involved in managing your legacy code. Um, she, she kind of propagated this idea a couple years ago, and it's a good one in our book. So just so we know what empathy is, for uh, here's the old online dictionary definition, is the psychological identification with or vicarious experiencing of the feelings, thoughts, or attitudes of another. Um, the second one isn't so pertinent to, to our 
purposes here, but it's uh, to really uh, um, emphasize what this word is about. It's you know, really trying to identify with somebody. It's different from sympathy where you actually feel sorry for someone, which could even be like a power dynamic, you know, I feel so sorry for you all. But empathy is like, I understand you, I get you. I'm going to do things so that you feel like a real person that matters because, you know, this is how I know that, you know, how to make that possible for you is like by building a great software project that's not hard for you to use, but, you know, has a great user interface, has good documentation. I'm going to be nice to you so that you have a good experience in that way. Um, you know, if you're a contributor or user, like, you're going to feel comfortable coming back to me in my community. So, you know, this is how you empathize. Uh, one good thing to do every once in a while is do an empathy audit of ourselves. And why would we do this? Well, just to make sure we're as empathetic as possible. Uh, this is, again, a discipline like communicating that uh, one can develop over time and constantly get better at. And there's lots of benefits of doing so. Um, you know, we all tend to like friendly, empathetic people because they make us feel good. So on a scale of one to five, from low to high, how would you rate your own empathy? And you know, that might be hard because you're like, well, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. But uh, go to the internet and find examples of, and read about empathy and how to be empathetic and then get, you know, figure out your own metric. Um, when you aren't communicating empathetically enough, what does that feel like in your body and mind? Usually when we're not uh, communicating effectively or um, nicely, we'll, we'll feel it, you know, we'll feel a little twinge of guilt. So, um, you know, what, what is that? Reckon with that feeling. Reckon with the thought of that. Oh, I should have done better, you know. Like, sit with that and think about, well, how could you do better next time? When you're communicating empathetically, how does that feel? You know, we might feel very good about that experience, and it's good to sit with that feeling, too. Um, and then finally, do you reflect on your communication to improve your collaboration? You know, do you regularly think about how you communicate and ask people for feedback and see how you can do better? Um, some e exercises to reinforce your empathy journey um, is that when you're frustrated with somebody or something, just stop. But what if you're so busy you can't stop? So like, I've heard this before um, in certain open source communities. Well, you know, we're just so busy we're like merging all these pull requests and reviewing all this code, and we just that can't stop. We can't stop. We're like robots. But you know, what if you're, um, you know, that's kind of a perception that we develop in ourselves. Uh, you can stop, even if it's for a few moments, uh, before you say or do something that you might regret, like you're rude to someone. So you know, pause. It's the easiest way to. Avoid a lot of trouble. Just pause. If somebody really makes you angry, just get up, walk away, come back. Uh, and then respond, you know, in a, in a different way than you might if you're, like, filled with energy and venom. Um, and if this is a real problem for you, like, if you are kind of wired to be, like, going after folks on a regular basis or you have anger management problems, journal, talk to a peer, go seek help. It will, it will make you um, happier in the long run because it really doesn't feel good if we're always just going off on people. Um, we're going to help you uh, get started now. Uh, we're going to throw in a minute of meditation for you. So um, if we can set the clock, I guess we have what right here. Yeah. So uh, just see what happens when, you know, maybe some of you are already meditators. Who actually does meditate on a regular basis? Oh, okay, a couple people. Yeah, yeah it's we gotten popular. So if you haven't done it before, here's your chance. So count your breaths. Um, as you inhale, we're starting the minute here. Um, so as you inhale, just silently think one. So breathe in, one, and then exhale, two. And then inhale, three, exhale, four. Inhale, five, exhale, six, Inhale, seven, exhale, eight. Inhale, nine, exhale, ten. Inhale, one, exhale, two. Inhale, three, exhale, four. All right, so that's a minute. You can do this three times, you could do this a hundred times at home. There's other ways to meditate, you know, stare at your feet, think about your feet, 
Uh, think of your thoughts as little pieces of ice floating down a river. You know, there's always you can do this. Um, but the idea is that you just kind of think about your thoughts and detach from like all of the craziness that goes on in all of our, our brains. You know, we're constantly thinking about things, usually in a very rapid fashion. And if we don't take a step back sometimes and we just allow this to happen, we can get very stressed out very quickly and also not become in touch with the effects of all of these racing thoughts on our mood. Um, so I think we only have two minutes, two minutes left. Oh, really? Oh, well. Okay. So I guess we'll hurry up. Um, so a couple of ways to empathize with people in addition to becoming a Zen master and chilling out and being mindful are um, setting up a personal readme. We all know what readmes are, so just make one for yourself. How do you operate? What are your pet peeves? What will make you ragey and stressful um, or annoyed? Uh, how would you like to be communicated with so that you don't have a negative mood response? Um, these are some of the things you can do. Yeah, I still don't need that. Okay. Um, right. so, so then, um, so then wait, there's another section here in the slides that you can look off, um, uh, offline about um, building shared goals among a team. Um, with brainstorming techniques, other kinds of techniques to get the team communicating together. Obviously, that's that's a, you've seen now a, a big theme in in my experience is um, you know, getting people working together, brainstorming ideas, deciding um, goals together, rather than um, you know working off of lists or or some kind of top down. It's a great way to, to operate um, within a team. Actually, a lot of a lot more details, um, a lot of details there, and ways that you can focus. Like I say, in a, in a future talk, we'll, uh, we can get you updated on that. And then um, the last part we wanted to talk a little bit about um, is, um, is inclusion and, um, and, and having that perspective. I don't, do we want to try to do another exercise or? We can try to do it in the hallway. Yeah, okay. So, so why don't you, so why don't we leave you this as, as a homework exercise afterwards and then we can take a couple questions. Um, so, so the way that we set this up was, you know, think about um, some of the things um, that, that make you more aware um, of, of how you're responding, you know, why you might have difficulties with a certain communication, other communications, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of background to that. And, and the exercise um, that we did when we did this um, in, um, in Edinburgh was to ask people to, um, to talk with the person next to them um, and talk about um, two cultural things that, that may not be obvious from, um, from just uh, physically looking. And um, we're not going to ask you to do it here um, because in Edinburgh we lost control of the room when we asked people to talk to each other. We were really afraid that no one was going to talk to each other and everyone was just going to stare and we were going to be stuck. And ultimately everyone just kept chatting and we were like, wait, we're still here. We have two microphones. <laughs> um, so, so we'll leave you this as an exercise um, after the fact. But this is, is super powerful even in, in a work setting. You know, not sharing everything about yourself, et cetera, but having a way to connect at, um, you know, at a cultural slash, uh, slash human level. Yeah, you might find your next collaborator here. If you're at an event tonight and you say, like, oh, what are two things about you I would never expect? Oh, here are two things about me. And then you can start a conversation, as our group, our audience did uh, in Edinburgh, like, right. that you might not want to stop. But we won't be there to tell you to stop. So. <laughs> Right, or you can do it after, after uh, Leslie does the housekeeping, let's, yeah. let's everyone go. Um, so we can, I guess we can take some questions. I guess we have both microphones, so we, we our own. <laughs> we need more.